Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. I am your moderator for today, Carl Cassell. John Adams, President John Adams was quoted as saying, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Most citizens of this country would hold to the belief that America is a well-functioning society. Within the functions of this society, it would have three equal legs on its stool. Each leg would represent our economic, political, or religious slash social component. Now, for those who won't subscribe, wouldn't subscribe to any specific religion, they would term it as social or the moral code for the country. The third leg is the religious social component, and it includes moral and ethical constituents needed to keep the stool upright and sound. So I have joining me today three guests that will discuss if Christian nationalism is good for the country. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First joining me, we have Connie Ryan, Executive Director of the Interfaith Alliance of Iowa. How are you today? I am well. Thank you for having me on the show. You're very welcome. Next, Ray Vassar, um, who is the founder and executive director of Defender Ministries. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Carl. You're very welcome. And finally, Dr. Peter Yahainen. Hopefully I said that right. Mm -hmm. Professor of Religion at Kirkwood Community College. Sorry about butchering your name. And hello. Oh, it's good to be on the show. Good, good. And so we just want to jump right into it. And so let's start with the definition of Christian nationalism paired with, could it better be described as religious nationalism? Well, I'll take a shot at this, um, and I'm drawing from the work of uh, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, who have written a book uh, called uh, Taking America Back for God, and they, they define Christian nationalism as a, a cultural framework or, or an ethno-religious political ideology, which seeks to fuse um, American civ civic life with a particular conservative type of Christian identity and culture. And so Christian nationalism pro provides a set of ideals and values and narratives and myths through which Americans perceive and navigate uh, their world. So what it's essentially about is, is, a, is a political ideology and it's a cultural framework that's trying to tie together a certain set of Christian assumptions with uh, American identity. And typically it includes people who think that America was founded as, as a Christian nation, that America is a chosen nation by God, given a special purpose by God, and that the government should privilege Christianity in a lot of its legislation, that it should, pr should promote Christian values and the like. So in this specific American context, uh, the kind of nationalism that we're seeing certainly to this very day and throughout American history is a, is a Christian form of nationalism. Anyone want to add to that? I would just add that it is really um, this idea of favoritism and that um, one particular group is the favorite um, in our nation. Um, that's the viewpoint. It's a really kind of a worldview of how they look at their place in society and the place of everybody else. And then using that as a means really to discriminate against a number of different groups that they, um, that Christian nationalists often target. And we can talk some more about that and who that might be. But it is, um, it's this idea that they are, are the favorites. They are the ones that are the chosen people. And I would uh, just add to that, that, you know, from a different perspective, I don't know that there's a clear definition of what it is. I mean, we have different people defining Christian nationalism, and it, I see it essentially as a smokescreen, but based on even Peter's statement, it, it is an ideology. 
based on the premise of what I would say that an individual's loyalty and devotion to a nation state surpassed any other individuals or group interests. I would, I would uh, pick up on a couple of points here uh, for, uh, for what Connie was saying, that Christian nationalism is all about establishing symbolic bo boundaries and symbolic hierarchies. It's about drawing lines in the sand between so-called real Americans and lesser second-class Americans. Uh, it's about treating the other as, as a second-class citizen. And so... Um, Christian nationalism is, is all about kind of establishing these sorts of symbolic boundaries of who truly belongs and who, you know, the outsiders who are at times merely tolerated, right? Um, and, and so, yes, it does, it, it does uh, divide people between us and them, as it were, right? Oh, and, and, and to pick up Ray, on Ray's point, I would argue that Christian nationalism isn't even about loyalty to the country, because uh, I would say that's more of patriotism, but that Christian nationalism is more about loyalty to your par particular tribe. And in, a, in the American context, it's all about, been about loyalty to a particular, particular ethno-religious tribe. Uh, and throughout American history, it's often been white Christian nationalism that's that's been uh, at the at the forefront, uh, affirming a certain white Christian identity. So. Well, and to be honest, um, there's not really much connection to my understanding of Christianity. Um, and so, it, although it has that in its title and, it's, and, and it says Christian nationalism that is kind of a self-professed that 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 group that tribe as peter was talking about um ascribes to christianity but in reality um there there really is very little connection to um the new testament of christianity and and we don't need to get too deep into theology, but um, my understanding of Christianity or somebody else's understanding of Christianity has very little connection to what is um, talked about and ascribed to in in the Christian nationalist um, purview. And um, especially when you're talking about targeting particular uh, marginalized communities and, and um, professing um, ideas of hate and bigotry towards those groups. So, so I wanted. Oh, go ahead, please. Nope. Go ahead, Carl. So I, I want to jump in because you guys have touched on a lot of my separate questions. So I want to throw this out and give us kind of an opportunity to unpack this. So from its beginnings, you know, Christian nationalism um, has uh, kind of em em evoked. Um, uh, American exceptionalism um, to the point that it um, has really made itself look like it's better than all the other nations, um, but it's become increasingly partisan, div divisive, ideological, and almost militant at times. Um, and so we've talked about marginalized groups. So this causes these folks up that would say they're a part of this to lose sight of the tenets of the New Testament and caring for those that might be often um, suffered prolonged persecution or um, uh, who are ignored. And so the policies um, that they champion kind of are wrapped into some of that continued oppression. Do you guys wanna talk about that and what are the dangers um, with this becoming the case? Well, I think you have to first understand what characterizes how we got here today, whether it's through, uh, you know, from a Christian nationalist standpoint or nationalism, whatever we want to call it, 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 there's a character behind it that has influenced our curriculums, our legislation, and even down to the corporate policy. Because uh, I think Connie alluded to it earlier, we, it's almost a clash of worldviews and, and of generations. And so you have to look at history to say, well, how did we get here? And how do we get, you know, a, a dis such a disparity between one group versus another? Well, that's how this country was essentially founded. 
um, to set that tone. This Christian nationalism isn't something that's new. Um, and I think it's a deceptive means to achieve a level of trust. And we can go back to everybody pointing to the January 6th, 6th atrocity on Capitol Hill um, as part of the, the move to get back to the conservative way of life in this country. But that comes from the worldview clash of generations because this generation, in my opinion, I think the theorists have done a great job, <laughs> if you will, of infiltrating the institutions, whether it's in reference to journalism, political science, or, you know, above all else, education. And so this is what the clash is. So we have a generation that says, welcome to the party. And then we have another generation that says, what the heck is going on? We got to get back to our values because this country is morally declining. And so I, I think that's where we have to, you know, at least in my opinion, we have to start to begin to understand how we got here. And people uh, allude, you know, they don't necessarily fall into that camp to say, well, you know, how was this country founded? Well, I believe it was based on the, a, a type of deist system, if you will, with our founding fathers. But uh, that's another point. But I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, uh, Christian nationalism in America has a long history. And we could go back to the, the founding of the country. Uh, we could go back to, you know, after the American Revolution, you've got certain ministers and leaders who are promoting the idea of America as a chosen nation. Uh, we see it throughout the 19th century with the idea of manifest destiny and, and being given this divine permission to go conquer the West and, and exploit the Native Americans and the Mexicans and, and, and so forth. So, you know, and we've seen it with, um, you know, opposition to uh, various types of immigration over American history. I think this current uh, inception of Christian nationalism, the, over if you look at the last 50 years, it's, it's in large part in reaction to the changes of the 1960s and 70s, in which people who were previously marginalized, women, African-Americans, Latinos, uh, the LGBTQ uh, community, right? People who in the past had been marginalized by society, are now getting uh, gaining uh, greater rights, right? And so I think this current inception of Christian nationalism is in part, and, and, the, and the growing uh, diversity of the 1960s and 1965, we uh, liberalized our immigration laws, right? And so there've been these huge cultural societal changes that have occurred and huge demographic changes that have, have, have occurred. And so now we're witnessing this backlash. There, there is a particular conservative strain, and I would add, especially a white Christian conservative strain in our culture that's worried about holding on to their privilege and worried about holding on to power. And Christian nationalism is all about maintaining and holding on to power. And I would just piggyback on that, Peter, and I think you hit on something, but wouldn't we, can't we say though that the very statement that you just made, which makes total sense, has been derived from a historical text. I would go back further than 60 years because you have to go back to the founding, the foundation of this country and the 17th, 18th century even. Because if you look at, uh, from a deistic standpoint, if you know what that is, well, it, it's, it's God based on a reason rather than revelation or teaching of any specific religion. And if you look at our constitution today, it's specific to that. You know, you got the separation of church and state. You can go to the articles and see that. But to your point in marginalizing other groups uh, and specifically white supremacy, if you will, that was from the inception. Oh, and this is nothing new. Would you yeah. would you would you say? Oh, no. I mean, um, no, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Um you know, the founders uh, anticipated a, a largely kind of white Christian nation from the very beginning. And, you know, African-Americans were, they were, in, I mean, <laughs> slavery is, is, is enshrined in the Constitution. So uh, from, the, f from the very inception, then, you've got a certain kind of, uh, you know, mythology about the nation. Um, right. uh, and, and, and one of the interesting things about the current, conception of white Christian nationalism is that 
a lot of them would argue that the separation of church and state, which is there in the U.S. Constitution, it's in the it's in the First Amendment. You know, God isn't even mentioned in the Constitution. Um, you've got people who say that, well, the separation of church and state is a myth. <laughs> or even if it's not a myth, they would like to see Christianity privileged by our our le uh, our legislatures, uh, which would be a violation of constitutional norms. I think one of the points or one of the parts of the question that you were asking, Carl, was also about the impact, right? There, it's not just about history. It's not just about um, that we have these, these groups that are claiming favoritism um, and that they are the chosen people. And it's not just about a uh, fight for power, but it's how they do that. And so we're seeing um, a lot of legislation. We're seeing a lot of public rhetoric um, in, the, in the public square um, around these issues and a particular narrative that is happening. And one of the things that we're most concerned about as an organization, Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, is um, this normalization of the rhetoric that we're hearing in the public square around these issues. And the more people say these things and, and um, talk from a framework of bigotry and hate, and it becomes a more normalized um, way. And so that takes it then into the legislative sphere. And we've been seeing for the last six or so years, really before that, but exponentially increasing in the last six years, pieces of legislation that target different particular communities, the LGBTQ community, women and women's rights, um, racial justice um, issues, and, and the whole narrative around critical race theory and teaching that in public schools, which we know is just simply not true, um, and whitewashing and erasing history, all of those pieces we're seeing in the legislature. And so it's not just the narrative in um, that public narrative, but it's also the impact then on public policy, which has grave consequences when those pieces of legislation are debated um, and then potentially passed. And it doesn't even have to be that they are passed. Just having that conversation in the Iowa legislature and in legislatures across the country does grave danger, um, grave harm um, to um, people of color and to women and to the LGBTQ community and also to the Jewish community and the Muslim community and other um, uh, smaller religious traditions. And so that's part of the danger that Christian nationalism has placed on our country. In my opinion, it is a threat to our democracy. It's a threat to religious freedom and it's a threat to our rights um, at, under the First Amendment when this becomes a normalized narrative. I was gonna ask uh, that question, do we see it as a threat? So you answered it, thank you. Um, but can it be, or does it become an invoke an almost idolatrous loyalty to the nation that is not even based on a lot of times um, true facts or looking at each circumstance um, kind of one by the one. It's just an idolatrous uh, a loyalty. D does it lend um, to some sort of idolatry? I think it does. I think it's an idolatry to the movement, but it's also um, becoming an idolatry also to certain figures in the public square. And so we see that with former President Trump. We see that with other leaders in their their movement. Um, and it is, um, in my opinion, it is a, a form of idolatry um, rather than, um, you know, if you're going to attach Christianity to a name rather than following the teachings of Christianity, they are following something entirely different. Anyone and I would, I would, you know, agree to a point with, with Connie, because from a scriptural standpoint, you know, Christian Christianity and what it has to say about this nationalism move, it doesn't, scripture doesn't support the idea of it. You know, anybody that claims that their nationality places them, you know, uh, above and beyond what scripture's intent is, which in this case, from, from my standpoint, from even a theist standpoint, is Jesus Christ. And, 
you know, and blessing and denying the very foundation of the gospel truth. And as a citizen who places their devotion above that on the same le- or on the same level as the allegiance to a, their country, I would say is guilty of idolatry. Yeah, I, w- I would agree that any any form of nationalism, if, if you're putting especially loyalty to a particular particular ethno-cultural control of your country, but then, you know, ultimately, if you're worshiping your country above God, for example, um, then, then yeah, that's a form of idolatry. And, and I would, um, you know, concur with, with what's been said here that, you know, Christianity teaches you to love one another, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Christian nationalism teaches you to demonize people who disagree with you, uh, who... You know, it teaches you to hate others who are not part of of your particular movement. And and to kind of piggyback on what Connie was saying, I'm quite alarmed at the uh, the danger of that this poses to uh, the future of American democracy in that Christian nationalism, uh, in its creation of these symbolic boundaries between us and them, between real Americans and non-Americans and the like, uh, it ends up baptizing authoritarian rule. And so more and more, uh, the studies have shown that people who score highs high on the scales of Christian nationalism are more willing to entertain the possibility of the kind of, uh, you know, political strongman or, you know, they, 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 it, uh, endorse authoritarian anti-democratic measures, and we're seeing this in voter, voter suppression, in voter intimidation, uh, gerrymandering of districts, and the like, because um, the people who are most adamant about this, who are most supportive of this movement, they're, they're worried about their loss of power. And, and, and so they are willing to engage you know, this discourse of violence right now. Uh, and we could even talk about the January 6th insurrection, an attempt to overturn a legitimate presidential election. That I remember watching uh, this unfold on on my TV screen, and and uh, this insurrection was chock full of symbols of Christian nationalism. You had these flags which said something like "Jesus saves" and "Donald Trump is my president," and you had this juxtaposition of cross and flag and all these symbols of um, Christian nationalism uh, and the insurrection was in large part inspired by this particular vision. And so we've seen the violence of January 6th and we're seeing this continuation of this violent rhetoric of demonizing people who are different from them. And and that uh, I'm quite fearful for the future of American democracy if... Um, if, if the Christian nationalists uh, continue to hold such sway. And I would piggyback on that, Carl, from the perspective that, you know, Christian nationalism doesn't mix. And here's the danger. It, you know, it's it's being proposed as a political theology. And, and that co opts some of the Christian narratives that's been described here today and symbolism. And it has its own version of what we would deem the elect. <laughs> Those chosen by God, this nation was not God chosen. It was, you know, biblically speaking, it was the Jewish nation and it was the the disciples that brought the message of truth to the world and not the United States of America. But that's another discussion. But, you know, they say they're people like us, meaning conservative Christian, but also white, natural born citizens in in what we would deem in, in America as a prosperous nation. And only the elect in this country should control the political process, while others we closely scrutinize, like some of the groups we describe or discourage or even deny access to certain things. And so all the policies are built around this. And then you bring in the the whole relativism type of idea, you know. And so we have these things because a a true democracy, democracy, excuse my language, a true democracy as it should be a way of governing. That's how we define it. And that depends on the will of the people. Well, you look around, it's not much being done by the will of the people in this country. And so, you know, it doesn't mix. And scripture from a biblical standpoint 
what these Christian nationalists are touting, it, it, it's it's off centered because God even called it not to mix. Politics is politics, and you know what God says is. But this again, Peter, we talked about this earlier. This goes back to the foundation, and this is how it was built. It was always denied, and true faithful Christians who don't want to get mixed up in this nationalism movement are told to check their worldview at the door before they vote, before they teach anything in reference to what I would deem secular progressivism. Uh, this is what characterizes, again, as I said earlier, how we got here today. And so th that's why I think it's a potential danger, because it's going to eventually take away all religious freedom. One more, too. Go ahead, Connie. I was just going to say, one of the things that I think is most important about this conversation is helping people to understand that even that Christian national, nationalism exists, what it is. Um, there was just recently the Pew Research um, group um, had a survey and they asked questions around is, is um, our nation a Christian nation? Did the founders intend it to be a Christian nation? Those kind of questions. But it also asked about Christian nationalism and only 24% of Americans found it to be, found Christian nationalism to be unfavorable. And 54% of Americans didn't really even know enough to have an opinion. And so conversations like this, I think are critical to, to get the word out to, for people to start thinking about this and finding information, accurate and factually based information to do their own research and to have conversations about what Christian nationalism is and the impact that it can, that it is having on our democracy, that it is having on particular communities um, that are impacted, um, most especially that it is having impact on legislation. And so that in, impacts public policy, that impacts different communities differently. Um, and so it is important to have these conversations. And so I'm grateful that, that we're able to, to do this um, and to really dig into some of this, um, the details on this. Thank you, guys. Well, we are <laughs> out of time. It always goes by entirely um, too fast, but I want to thank each of you for uh, um, delving into this topic and really having thoughtful discussion. And I hope um, um, the viewer enjoys it as well. So while those who call themselves patriots are directed to employ by any means possible, and even at times used undemocratic and violent methods to win political contest, this ultimate quest for political power showcases Christian as a religion without humility, as is the message of God's love for all humanity. If we are truly tasked with living out the highest form of Christian ideals, as a country, regardless of your faith, then a fresh perspective must be presented in order to avoid a clash and splintering only uh, similar to the time of our nation's civil war. It will take mature conversation and understanding to preserve the union. Please be that light of choice. Thank you and have a great day, all of you.